chest up, shoulders back. This is Revival Fitness, your home for gains and brains. And it is finally, finally, time to discuss the side effects of being shredded, as I recently got here for the first time in my life. A lot of guys, from what I gather, seem to think that they can just do a general cut and get to roughly 10% body fat or so. I put this picture up in my community tab a little bit ago, and I asked how close this was to people's ideal physique. And this was a comment I found interesting. This guy basically said, I would love this 10 out of 10 if I could just kind of get here and maintain it without having to put in too much effort. And as I replied to him, well, I'm afraid I've got some bad news. So we're going to do a thorough dissection of my body fat in an upcoming video, not this one because that is an entire discussion in and of itself. And of course, I've got novice and intermediate training programs available as well. These are much more than just exercises on a sheet. I lay out everything you need to know to make serious gains in the long haul. So let's begin with my body fat itself. I've never done one of these, but I got an in-body scan on May 22nd, three days out. And according to this, my body fat was 3%. So at the time of taking this, I was 158.9 pounds. You could just round up to 159. 4.8 pounds total of body fat, meaning my lean body mass was 154.1 pounds. So was I actually 3% body fat? No. I think you could easily add a 5% to that as a buffer to be safe and say 8%. I mean, I might have even been upwards of 9%, maybe even a bit more. I could have gotten a DEXA scan. I was looking up ones around my area. I only seemed to find $200 in price. I saw some people mention, I forget the name of the company or the place that does them. People were saying it was like $60 or $70. I guess it's too late now. But something I want to note is that once you get down to the point that you're 10% or below, and even kind of leading into that point, you have to understand that with every single body fat percentage that you lose... Not only does it get that much harder, which is the negative, but the positive is that you notice more drastic physical changes with every percent. So like anything else, it's yin and yang, it's pros and cons, it's trade-offs. You get crazier and crazier looking, the leaner that you get, but it only gets that much harder to do, let alone maintain. And with every additional percentage of body fat that you lose, I'd say especially past roughly 10% or so for men, the more that the hormonal effects become amplified. So the more that you cut down, the more that your natural testosterone levels are going to drop. There's really no way around that. There are certain factors you can do to keep the levels, I guess, as high as you possibly can. I did neglect to get mine taken at the start of this prep. The most recent reference point I have is from April 2022. That was near the start of my last prep, which is over two years ago at this point. Then my level was 805 which is on the higher end of the reference range. I got mine taken whenever I was about five days out, and drumroll, the final reading was 206. So while the 805 number I have is a bit old, I do think it's going to line up pretty well to what I would start with now, or something pretty close to that. So if we take 805 versus 206, that is a nearly four times reduction. If you guys would like to check your own hormones with an at-home sample, no need to go to the doctor. You can use code REVIVAL25 at trylgc.com slash revival. Very simple process. You get mailed the testing kit, take your sample, you mail it back to them, and you get to see your results and the reference ranges within your confidential online portal. Now, something to keep in mind with testosterone levels and any other hormone marker like that too Getting them tested just one off like this is not a guarantee. So depending on a ton of different factors, your levels might be relatively low on one day. It could be diet related, sleep related, stress. Because I was cutting for that long, I would say this is a pretty accurate assessment. And if you want to get lean enough to be competitive in bodybuilding, be a serious fitness model, whatever it's going to be, this is simply what you have to do. There is no way around it. I've talked about this before. I find it very funny whenever bodybuilders and those involved in the scene talk about health. Bodybuilding is not healthy. It has nothing to do with health, and it never has. Maybe back in, what, the 1930s and 40s, maybe? And yes, this goes for natural or enhanced, because guys always say, oh, well, we know that the steroids are a problem, but natural bodybuilding is so much healthier. No, it's not. Doing severe cuts and getting ripped for competition is not good for your body, no matter how you're doing it. And you could even argue that doing it naturally is going to have worse immediate side effects 
because you don't have any assistance for your hormones that are plummeting. And that brings us on to the holistic side effects. So as I just alluded to, your body is going to start fighting you the deeper into a cut that you go. One of the biggest ways is by expending less energy. And this is something that you cannot consciously stop. You are going to, even if you don't realize it in the moment, in hindsight, you'll notice that you are just sitting down more, you sit on the toilet for longer, you might sit in your car for longer when you drive somewhere, and you're just there for 20 minutes, don't even realize that you're doing it. I mean, your body's going to find any way it can to make you just move less and do less things overall as a way to compensate. And the more that you cut down too, the more that your body is going to drop its basal metabolic rate to accommodate for that. Not only are you just generally tired during the day, you probably are going to be taking naps. I was at a point to where I was napping like a baby at least one time a day, sometimes twice a day. I mean, it was not uncommon for me to wake up around 7 a.m. I would eat breakfast, do some work. I would take like a 20 minute nap around noon or 1 p.m. I would then work a little bit more, do some other things. I was about to go to the gym at night. I would take another nap before I drove to the gym at like 6 p.m. or so. But it was at the point to where I was not really even willingly doing so. I would just sit on my bed for a couple seconds, look at my phone, and I would basically just get sucked in to taking a nap, almost like there was gravitational pull of my bed. And what also was messed up was my libido. Now, I did not experience significant side effects with this until... I want to say five weeks out, roughly, maybe a bit more or less, depending. But it was not terrible. I mean, I was still able to get hard, and I was still looking at women and stuff for most of the cut. I mean, this was not a major problem for most of it. But once I got to that point of roughly a month out, I was not jerking off at all during the day. For reference here, my sex drive now was back with a vengeance. I have been cranking it numerous times a day to the point that it's genuinely distracting. And I'm sure the nofap guys are losing their minds right now. See, we told you, bro! But I'll tell you what, for those of you that do want to go far into your nofap journey and reach ascension, or whatever you call it, reach day 1000 or whatever, you want to do that the easiest way possible, the fastest way possible? Cut down for a bodybuilding show. And here's when I knew it got really serious. I would be in person. And whether it's girls that I sort of know and just talk to casually, or if it was just girls, you know, when you're in the gym or out in public, you're like, oh, she's cute, she's hot, all that stuff. I wasn't even having that. I was complete Sigma grind set monk mode, and I did not focus on or care about women at all. And I'll tell you what, in a way, that was pretty liberating. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I had a crush on a girl whenever I was six years old back in freaking kindergarten, and it just happens the rest of your life as a man. You're always just checking out women in some form. There's really no way around it, unless your hormones are completely tanked. And don't tell me anything to the contrary, because I know some dudes that are totally checked out of the dating scene, and like the going their own way guys, they'll say stuff like, oh no, I never focus on women at all. I don't even acknowledge that they exist. And it's like, dude, you know that you're looking at them, and you know that viscerally you want them in some form. Even if you're not dealing with them, your body's telling you to do so. Okay, can you guys please stop lying to yourselves? One thing to note, I was not seeing any women going into the conclusion of this cut. So, if I was, maybe the outcome would have been different. Maybe I would have been able to perform, shall we call it, in that case. But this is speculation. I can't really say either way. We'll have to see what happens next time, I suppose. The bedroom is basically dead. Or it's very fleeting. Like, you might try and it's kind of just like, meh. So... Depending on the circumstance, this is going to vary per person, but the loss in libido is basically inevitable if you're going to really get ripped. It's just something you have to put up with for a temporary amount of time, hopefully. Some people deal with those side effects for a long time, rebounding out of the show. It may take them numerous months to get their hormones back in full swing. For me, it took, I want to say... Three weeks total for things to really rebound. I was at a point there for a bit where I had the drive coming back, but I would not stay fully hard. I know this is a great discussion, isn't it? You know, whenever you're about to bust and it comes out, but it's just kind of sad. It kind of like dribbles halfway and it's just kind of weak. That was happening for a bit. And I was kind of worried like, oh God, is this going to be my life now? But within the past 10 days or so, it has come out like a rocket again. So on that front, I think we're back to where we were before. And it might be too high, in fact. I might have to find a way to even lower it down because my god, man. I'm about to whip it out. In terms of estrogen, I did not get that tested. 
I don't think there's any cause for concern. I'm not experiencing any typical estrogenic side effects. I was holding a bit of water in my face after the show, after a few days of absurd amounts of cheat meals, that's simply how it's going to be. I think that has dissipated to a good extent, but I am still relatively lean at this point. I can still see abs in the mirror. I've got serratus lines, I've got some veins in my arms, even a little bit in my legs still. And on the subject of testosterone, we're going to talk about my overall mood. And something a lot of people tie into this subject is always the roid rage. I did not experience any roid rage. That said, I definitely was more of a hothead than usual. One thing I want to note, guys, I am not as angry as I may appear or as you may perceive on camera. You know, people comment sometimes like, man, you're so upset. Is this guy always angry? That's just how I talk. You know, I don't know what or who you guys were raised around. If you guys were raised in these lily fields with unicorns and butterflies all the time and rainbows and stuff. I was raised around Italians. I mean, we yell and scream recreationally. We argue for sport. My tone of voice and demeanor and delivery, they're very normal to me, but that evidently is not the case for a lot of people. I would get more angry overtly, and I'm not the type to really cause a scene in public. I've never been that way. But the road rage is one thing. So if I'm driving and somebody, you know, they don't use their turn signal, or if somebody just is driving really slowly, I might start swearing at them, like, oh, you idiot, what the hell are you doing? That type of thing. Oftentimes more colorful language than that. Just in general, people are terrible drivers, man. I don't know how some of these people got their license. It's kind of scary that they did. But even during day-to-day -day tasks, the more I went into the cut, the shorter that my fuse became. So if I pull up something on the computer and it takes an extra two to three seconds to load. Like, oh, you piece of shit. Maybe something like cooking, you make a little mess and you just start swearing and huffing and puffing under your breath because it's too big of a deal to grab a napkin and clean it up. You know, little stuff like that would set me off more than normal. Overall, I would say the rage component is something I could very easily keep under control. So you commonly hear the term hangry. That is a real thing. So if you are hungry, you might be quick to react and snappy and that type of thing. Once you have a meal, though, you might settle down and kind of have that moment of clarity, like, oh, I was upset for no reason. Maybe even drinking water can do that as well. But, you know, when you're cutting heavily, it's like you're just walking so much, eating so little. You are going to be sleeping less in a lot of cases, too, which we're about to talk about sleep. There's a lot of factors that kind of pile on top of each other that just make you more of a short fuse than you might normally be. You may alienate your friends and family or, in general, just piss them off more. That's just, again, part of the process. There's nothing else you can really do. A select group of people may not encounter that at all. You know these motherfuckers that are always just happy and go lucky and just smiling and everything's good for them? Even if internally that's not the case, that's what they put onto the world. Some people are just like that. I tend to not have a great poker face. And then on to sleep. I slept pretty darn well for this prep. I did not experience major stirs during the night. I was not constantly waking up. I mean, toward the end, the final two or three weeks or so, I was definitely losing some sleep. I would wake up earlier. I would get up in the middle of the night and maybe have to pee and then just couldn't fall back asleep, which even then a lot of people deal with that even whenever they're not cutting. That's just kind of a general annoyance when it comes to sleeping. I don't do any of these things in terms of like blue or orange light glasses or you know, turning everything off by a certain time in terms of screens. But I cannot really complain about it. It was not something that affected me significantly. I mean, I could even say really at all. And that brings us into training. And a question I was asked pretty much every single day, oftentimes multiple times a day, was, Bro, what's your bench press? Can you still bench press 315? And people would also ask about the deadlift and the squat. Kind of those main exercises. And people really like to talk about the one rep maxes when it comes to those. You know, it's very funny with me, man. I get accused of being like this closeted power lifter or like this pusher of so-called powerlifting propaganda because I have told you guys you should focus on the big compound exercises, especially the newer to the gym that you are. I've given a number of reasons for that. I was not doing the bench or the squat or the deadlift in any regular capacity, really at all. So I don't know what my one rep max is on any of those things. I don't even have rep work to sort of base that on, getting a rough estimate. Why did I not do those lifts? Well, a few things. Let's go in order squat, bench, deadlift. The back squat is something for me that I just don't see a point in programming anymore. 
I had 405 pounds on it almost three years ago at this point. So, I mean, I would probably be squatting if I was doing it regularly upwards or more than 500 pounds. The thing with back squats for me is they are very hard on my shoulders. It's to the point where it's just not worth doing and dealing with. Also, too, I can work my legs better with other things. When I say legs, I should say quads. That's what I really mean. People say legs, and that's vague, because that also could include the hamstrings, even the glutes, depending on how you kind of break things up. But I can get more direct quad stimulus, and really much less fatigue overall. That's the biggest thing. I'm much more inclined to do something like Hatfield squats, if I'm going to do any type of barbell squat in general. Front squats, I would prefer those, but those also bring about their own problems with the grip. That is annoying in its own right. So I put a lot of my quad focus now onto types of leg presses and other machines. Also, maybe lunges or step-ups. In terms of bench, you guys saw that I hit 315 at the peak of my bulk at about 200 pounds body weight. So that is over a 1.5 times body weight multiplier. And 315 for me was the big goal. And I spent a lot of time, a lot of freaking time, clawing and scratching my way to that. I would bet money on this. I could not bench 315 by the end of the cut. I mean, not even close. I would say even probably six weeks into the cut, I couldn't still bench 315. It would not surprise me at all if I could not even hit 275 for one by the end of this cut. The bench press, guys, is extremely correlated to body weight. I mean, if you reduce the water that you're holding, you could lose five to eight pounds of water weight when you start a cut, especially if you drop the carbs out of your diet. Your bench press is going to go down in all likelihood simply because of that. I mean, the more weight that you drop, the worse and worse your bench is going to get. I mean, at the very best, it's going to simply plateau. During the cut, I think the last time I bench pressed was... Uh, February 2024, I believe, and I got 225 for, I want to say, seven or eight reps or so, and I actually got the same thing about a week ago, because I had not bench pressed in that long, my body weight's gone back up, I wanted to just kind of see what I could do, and I got 225 for seven, and those were all paused reps. Now, of course, as I bulk and gain more weight, I can get that back up, I could definitely hit 315 again if I want to. If I can end up hitting 350, 360, 365 in the next couple years, that would be great. But it's simply not high on my priority list. 315, three plates aside, was the big goal for me. We accomplished that. If I never bench press again, I'll be totally content. If you guys want to see my full breakdown of all the factors that go into achieving a 315 bench, check out the video, click the eye in the top corner. What must the average man do to bench press 315? go into a lot of detail there. But in terms of the cut, I don't see a reason to keep bench pressing. Beside the fact that you're going to keep regressing on it, not only is that physically not good because you could be making gains if you switch to, for example, dips or weighted push-ups or a general chest press machine, because the goal, even if you're cutting, still should be to progress, if at all possible. That's one end of it. The second end of it is, it's demoralizing. Mentally speaking, watching your bench just plateau, plateau, regress, 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 it is not going to be good for your overall mental state, and it could really throw off your entire workout. Not to say that it has to. You could plateau on the bench and have a good workout otherwise. But just from that vantage point, cutting alone is hard enough as it is if you're going to get truly ripped. Just watching your bench press go to shit, it's another mental stressor you just don't need to deal with. Overhead press, I don't know. I have not regularly done OHP in a long time. Similar to the back squats, I think I stopped doing OHP a number of months, maybe half a year or so after I formally stopped back squatting. I was up to 135 pounds. That's one plate aside for, I think, seven to eight reps at the peak. And that was a while ago, too, so I probably could do more now if I reacclimated to it. If there's any part of my body that does not need much attention, it is definitely the delts, so I don't see the OHP taking priority anytime soon. That said, I would assume it would go down. Similar to the bench press, maybe not exactly as much, but pressing strength in general on a cut is going to be the most affected compared to other movements. And when it comes to the deadlift, I have not done a conventional deadlift in a while now. I've switched primarily to Romanian deadlifts, I like to get that eccentric control. I got up to 405 pounds. I think six reps was the most that I did. One of my big goals going forward is to hit a five-plate Romanian deadlift for a handful of reps. That's probably going to take well into next year to achieve. In terms of how that translates to deadlift off the floor strength, I'm not entirely sure. 
I did pull 545 pounds for one rep, and this was without touching the conventional or really sumo deadlift for almost a year. Leading up to this point, I was only doing Romanian deadlifts and good morning variations. And this 545, my form was not spectacular. I sort of stiff-legged it up. That's just something that happens whenever you don't do an exercise for a while. I should have probably ramped up to it to pull more, but I didn't. I just felt like going for the rip and grip PR. That's kind of a cool experiment I like to do. I like to see how much I can increase my deadlift without actually deadlifting. That is not optimal but it can be done. In terms of the back as well, you could tie this into the deadlifts too, the posterior chain, I guess I should say. I'd say that's going to be similar to the legs. Some people may barely, if at all, see a drop off in their deadlift strength. I think that's inevitable. The more that you cut, keep in mind, we're not talking about just a power lifter cutting for a weight class and there's still 18% body fat. We're talking 10% or below here. There's a huge difference between those two, but I got my Romanian deadlift the last I checked on the cut. I think I was down to 365 for 5 reps or so. When it comes to the arms, I was able to hit PRs depending on the exercise. You would also hit a sticking point pretty quickly too. Guys always message me like, Hey man, I'm plateaued at 25 pound curls. Like, what do you weigh? 155 pounds? Like, well, yeah, man. I mean, you're just gonna have to gain weight. This applies to anything, but especially single joint movements, particularly with dumbbells that only go up by 5 pound increments you're going to hit a lot of walls. So I think the biggest overall takeaway was that hitting PRs and still making progress on machines, regardless of the type, was much easier than doing so with free weights. And I think a lot of that's going to come down to the loss of body mass, which is going to reduce the amount of force you can apply to the barbell, to the dumbbells, the overall stabilization. If you guys want a much more detailed explanation of how to keep the most muscle mass and strength while cutting, click the video in the top corner, the eye, and I will break that down for you. And finally, given everything we've talked about up to this point, how sustainable is being ripped for most men? That's going to depend on the body fat percentage that you reach. I'm going to go into more detail on my ideas about this in the upcoming body fat video. You could call it a spectrum like shredded, ripped, lean, something like that. I think the vast majority of men can, or at least they should be able to, if they can fix their hormones and their diet and other things that may be giving them problems, should be able to be comfortable and not have these issues if they are, say, 12-13% body fat. That is not to say that your muscle growth and strength and overall gym performance is going to be optimal at that body fat level, but I think most men should be able to be comfortable at that point. Down the line, after this bulk, because eating this much food, as you guys are going to see in the coming full day of eating video too, so many videos, but you guys are going to see the amount of food I'm eating is just so time-consuming. It's not cheap either. I might get to a point after this bulk where I kind of coast around at, say, 12%-ish body fat. I'll still have visible labs at that point. I think sub-10% is going to be too low for the vast majority of men, even if they could handle it in terms of the appetite, because some guys who are more ectomorphic, they don't have a big appetite in general, the hard gainers, those type of dudes, even if they could handle it from the appetite vantage point, they still may be suffering from just low energy, their gym performance might be so bad that they are not going to stay there. That is a practical element you have to consider too. Some guys would be willing to have that trade-off if they could be ripped, all the time. Way more people struggle to keep their food in check than to eat enough food in general, especially today. So for most people, getting below 10%, just maintaining the strictness of the diet needed to remain there, I mean, let alone get there. Let's be real, man. Most guys are never going to go below 13 to 15% body fat. The level of strictness with food and the adherence has to be extremely high just to get to roughly 10%. You're talking sub 10%? And like I said earlier, every single percentage you drop is that much more intense and that much more noticeable. Getting below that point, if you deviate from your diet at all, maybe beyond one or two planned, that's the key thing here, planned cheat meals a month, you are not going to be able to stay there. I mean, your body fat, once you get to a very low point, especially the mid-single digits, if you have just a bad couple of days, you can lose that look. So that's something you have to keep in mind when it comes to getting ripped. I learned this the hard way too. It's very common to think, oh, I can just diet for X amount of time and I'll get the abs. Then I can just stay there and look sick forever. 
It is not that easy, man. And I know there's gonna be guys in the comments, not me, bro. I maintain 8% all year, have been for a long time, no problems here, I still hit PRs, all this other shit. Okay, good for you, bro, assuming you're being honest, which you're probably not. There's always guys that are exceptions. Guys on that video I made about the 315 bench, all of them, oh, I bench 350 at 18. Anybody could do it. People love to think exceptions make the rules, especially people that don't realize the genetic gifts that they were blessed with. You need to realize if you want to get this Greek god look and have visible abs when just standing, I mean, it's going to take Herculean effort to get to that point. And it's going to take years to build the muscle mass needed to look good once you get to that point. So on the basis of the long-term commitment needed alone, most guys are not going to get there. And given everything we just talked about, the people that do get to that point are going to probably realize, a lot of them do, I don't even want to be this low body fat. It's just too much of a headache. It is too strict. They would rather coast around the point of being, say, 12% low teens body fat once you are in the position to do so and still have visible abs. And then you can sort of live life more comfortably there. You can still eat what you want to eat from time to time, go out to eat, you know, have some drinks on the weekend if you want to do that. You can get high, eat some snacks. But to be legitimately ripped, let alone shredded, you do not have that food freedom. If you want to stay at 7% body fat all the time, you're going to need a nice cocktail of performance enhancers and probably peptides and thyroid medication and maybe even some diuretics to do so. And then you can claim natural. Then you become a famous fitness influencer. Sounds easy enough, right? But this has been it for me, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Be sure to check out my programs and the Body Composition Bible down below. To get in direct contact with me, the best way to do so is on Patreon. And you're going to get access lifetime to our Discord server there. And be sure to use the links down below to save money on some great products and services as well. And I will catch you guys next time. Yeah.